Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Diamond. Um, Dr. Diamond is currently an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Medical Oncology. She's the co-director of the Phase I Expansion and Molecular Program at the University of Colorado Cancer Center, known as POEMS, and the founding co-director of the Women's Cancer Developmental Therapeutics Program. Her laboratory research focus is on targeted therapies for triple negative breast cancer and mechanisms of resistance. Her clinical research focus is on her clinical research focus is on first in human phase one clinical trials of new cancer agents and later phase clinical uh, trials in breast cancer. She previously served as the director of the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee and the Cancer Clinical Trials Office at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. So thank you, Dr. Diamond. And with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. All right, everybody. So it's uh, my pleasure to talk to you guys today. Thank you for the invitation. I am in the clinic at Cherry Creek Medical Center, and I'm on the uh, visitor Wi-Fi, and um, I hope that it's going to be fine. But if you are having problems, like it's freezing or something's not working right, just let me know. All right, so today I'm gonna to give you an overview of new developments in targeted therapies for triple negative breast cancer, but I'm also gonna review the basic biology of breast cancer and how we treat breast cancers in general, and then talk a little bit about our POEMS research group and clinical trials in general, going from phase one, phase two, phase three, and how we approach a patient that's referred to us for clinical trials. This slide illustrates the most common cancers diagnosed in men and women. And on the right side, you can see cancers that are diagnosed in women. And breast cancer is the most common cancer. It makes up about, um, so there's about 266,000 new cases a year. But you can see at the bottom, the estimated deaths from breast cancer is much lower only about 41,000. So there's a big spread between breast cancer diagnoses and uh, deaths related to breast cancer. And a lot of that is due to breast cancer being diagnosed at an early stage for most women and us having really effective therapies to prevent recurrences, again, for most women, not all. Here you can see the trends in age-adjusted cancer death rates in women, and you can see breast cancer is the gray line here, and there's been a steady decline since the 1990s in, uh, in deaths from breast cancer, so about a 39% decrease from uh, 1989 to 2015. And again, a lot of this is cancer screening and also new therapies. The probability of developing breast cancer increases as women get older. The lifetime incidence of breast cancer is one in eight or 12.4% but you could see that the likelihood of getting it in from birth to age 39.5%, 40 to 59, 3.4%. So most women that are diagnosed with breast cancer are gonna be older, not that we don't see it in younger women, but the risk of developing breast cancer increases as women get older. So if we were here in person, I'd make you guys help to uh, talk about some of these breast cancer risk factors, but it's a little bit harder uh, with a virtual meeting. So I'll do this. Um, so what do we think? What's the most common risk factor for breast cancer? It's being a woman. So men can develop breast cancer, but it's much less common. Uh, increasing age, 
And then there's a whole slew of reproductive factors over a woman's lifetime that can increase risk of breast cancer. So, and these are all hormonal factors that have to do with exposure to hormones. Um, so early menarche, late menopause, late first full-term pregnancy, nulliparity, lack of breastfeeding, and then women that have chest wall radiation, specifically mantle radiation, like we uh, use to treat some Hodgkin's lymphoma, that includes the upper inner quadrant of the breast. And so if women have that type of radiation in adolescence or young adulthood, they're at a much higher risk of getting breast cancer. Then there's inherited disposition, so familial breast cancer or hereditary breast cancer syndromes. The most common mutations are in BRCA1 or 2, but there's some other mutations that we know about now that also uh, pretend a very high risk of breast cancer. And then just basic family history. So even if you don't have one of those mutations traveling in your family, we know that women that have um, breast cancer in their family and first degree relatives, there's still um, an increased risk of them developing breast cancer, but the risk is not as high as if it's because of one of these mutations. And then prior uh, breast disease. So if you have a history of invasive breast cancer, then your risk of getting it again is higher. Although some of our therapies will reduce that risk of getting it again. So sometimes that kind of washes out, but we know that a woman that has had breast cancer once is at higher risk of getting it again, high breast density, um, and then atypical things. So like if you have uh, ductal carcinoma in situ or lobular carcinoma in situ, these are precancerous lesions and that can increase your risk. I also want to say that if you guys have questions, feel free to kind of interrupt. You can feel free to unmute yourself and just ask your question. You could also put it in the chat feature. As I'm giving the talk, I can't see the chat, but Amanda will let me know if you put something in the chat. So, you know, feel free for this to be an open discussion. All right, so what about modifiable risk factors? Okay, here's where I think we should ask people. Does anyone, can anyone think of a modifiable risk factor for breast cancer, something that you could do? To prevent breast cancer? Someone said obesity. Obesity, yep, okay. Diet. Diet, yep, what else? Exercise. Yeah, great. Anything else? Okay, those are the main ones. So modifiable risk factors. We know that weight gain after the age of 18 increases your risk of breast cancer, being overweight or obese, um, being on hormone replacement therapy. So not taking hormone replacement therapy would be a way to modify your risk factors. And then physical inactivity. So exercise is really important. And then alcohol. So breast cancer is not one of the highest uh, uh, risk associated with alcohol cancers, but it's still there. And so women that drink more than one drink a day or seven drinks a week do have an up to twofold increased risk in breast cancer. And then hereditary breast cancer syndromes. So you know, we talk a lot about a family history of breast cancer and breast cancer is really common. And, you know, these BRCA genes, there's a lot of talk about them, but really these mutations are only present in about five to 10% of breast cancers. So it's not a common finding. The most common of these genes are BRCA1 and BRCA2. And if women have these mutations, then we're more likely to see them diagnosed with breast cancer at a much younger age. They're more likely to have bilateral breast cancers, to have a family history of ovarian cancer, and to have triple negative breast cancer. And so there's different guidelines that talk about who should be tested for these mutations. And so genetic counseling is something that we have built into our multidisciplinary breast cancer clinics, where we see people that are newly diagnosed with breast cancer. And so we're always looking at, you know, how old are they when they're diagnosed with breast cancer? And, you know, does anyone in their family have it? Have they ever had ovarian cancer? We're kind of looking at these factors and then following guidelines to see who meets the guidelines where they should be tested. There are some groups now that are moving towards offering everybody the, the option to get tested. And we're thinking that maybe in the next couple of years, our guidelines will be adjusted to um, 
to um, allow that. Right now, insurance companies will only cover it if you meet um, NCCN guidelines. So uh, breast cancer screening is really important and it likely contributes to that nice decrease in breast cancer related deaths that we've seen over the last um, couple decades. And so this slide illustrates differences between our screening guidelines. We tend to follow the American Cancer Society guidelines rather than the US Preventative Task Force guidelines. So the American Cancer Society recommends that women can start mammogram screening at age 40. And again, this is for average risk women, not women that have a BRCA mutation or a strong family history. So you can start screening mammograms at age 40, um, but at age 45 is when the recommendation is that you really should. So 40 to 44, you know, you can talk to your doctor, you can make your own decision if you want to start then, but everyone should start with annual mammogram at 45. And then 55 and older, you could get it every two years instead of every year, or you could get it every year. And then you would stop screening mammograms when your life expectancy is less than 10. And so I really like these guidelines because they're, they could be individualized to the patient and kind of what their beliefs are and what they want to do. Um, but certainly uh, screening mammography saves lives by diagnosing breast cancers earlier. They're easier to treat. Um, and it, it's something that we, we really recommend. There's a whole different set of screening guidelines for women that are of high risk of getting breast cancer. And so these are women that we can put multiple things into calculators and say that their lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is more than 20 to 25%. And so this could be because they have a known BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation or um, other mutations that have similar increased risk. They could have like a family, a first degree relative that has one of those mutations and they haven't been tested or they had radiation to the chest or Lee Fraumini syndrome, which is a germline P53 mutation. So, you know, any of these women would get different screening. And so these women would actually have a mammogram every year, but they would also have a breast MRI. And so breast MRI is more sensitive and it can diagnose cancers earlier. And these women also would start screening at age 30 instead of 40. So we have different guidelines for women that are at high risk. Okay, I have a little case in here. Um, so a healthy 52 year old woman with no significant past medical history comes to her new primary care physician. She has no family history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer. She's never had a breast biopsy. She's postmenopausal. She doesn't take hormone replacement therapy, no new masses in her breast. So what risk group does she belong to and what screening would you recommend? So the options would be A, she's at average risk for breast cancer and would benefit from a clinical breast exam every year and a screening mammogram, or B, is she at high risk of breast cancer and would she benefit from annual clinical breast exam, screening mammogram, and breast MRI? What do you guys think? Maybe you can just put your answers in the chat and then we can just have Amanda let us know what most people say. Rather than so having, far, everyone is saying A. Yeah, so this is right. So she is at average risk, um, not no risk, right? She doesn't have any of those high risk features, but we still recommend that she should have um, a mammogram. Okay, good. So here's an example of what a mammogram looks like. So it's an x-ray test. And so on x-ray tests, fat tissue looks um, dark or black, and then more solid tissue looks white. And so every mammogram has two views built into it. So there's a craniocaudal view, which is top to bottom, and that's what's here on the left. And then there's a medial lateral oblique, which is like across the breast where you can see up under the arm here too. And in this mammogram, there's some areas of calcifications, which are little kind of punctate white dots in this area and this area that are concerning for ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS. 
We now have 3D mammography or tomosynthesis mammography that you might have heard of. And so this allows us to take pictures that go all the way through the breast, kind of like a CT scan of a breast, but it uses the same um, kind of standard two views and just one compression of the breast. And so 3D mammography increases the specificity. So if you are having non-specific findings, just because all the tissue is kind of compressed on top of other tissue that can be sorted out with the 3D mammography. So we recommend this. Okay, so second case study, a 40-year-old woman with a strong family history of breast and ovarian cancer was recently diagnosed with a BRCA mutation and presents to her doctor to to discuss screening. She plans to, un to have her ovaries removed, which would be a bilateral salping oophorectomy, but she prefers not to undergo risk-reducing bilateral mastectomy at this time. So what screening plan would you recommend for her? And I'll just let you guys read this. I won't read it to you. So far I see D as the answer. Yeah, so this woman is at um, higher risk of breast cancer. And so the recommendations would be for a clinical breast exam every six to 12 months, annual screening mammography, and an annual breast MRI, and it should start now. And when we do the mammogram and the breast MRI, we typically alternate those. So women will have some kind of assessment of the breast every six months. This is an example of what a breast MRI looks like. So you can see here that um, this is an area of enhancement in the right breast. And you can see this looks different than on the left side. Um, here you can see a lot of different patterns of enhancement that has to do with blood supply and perfusion, but this is concerning for cancer. So in summary, early detection saves lives. Um, Cancers that are detected through mammogram are generally diagnosed at an earlier stage. They're easier to treat and they have better outcomes. And so this is something that's really important. Breast cancer is also a cancer where we have chemo prevention, which is really unique and we don't talk about a lot, but there are treatments available for women that are identified as high risk and that can prevent them from getting breast cancer. So we know that the majority of all breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive or um, cancers that are expressing hormonal receptors. And so there are medicines like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors such as exemestane that can either block estrogen receptors or reduce estrogen in a woman's body. And these can decrease the risk of developing breast cancer in women that are over 35. And so this is something that in an oncology clinic, I don't see a lot of, but our surgeons run a high risk breast cancer clinic here at Anschutz. And so if patients are worried about their family history or think that they might be at high risk, they can come in, we can use the Gale model to calculate their risk and um, prescribe them tamoxifen or exemestane, depending on if they're pre or postmenopausal, if they're interested in, uh, in doing chemo prevention. Okay, so let's kind of switch gears here and just talk about the biology of breast cancer. But before I start on this new section, are there any questions about breast cancer screening? Okay, so Right now, we test all breast cancers for three markers. So we test for the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, and then something called HER2. HER2 is a protein that you have in every cell in your body, but in about a quarter of breast cancers, there's too much of it, and that makes for a more aggressive breast cancer, but we now have therapies that block HER2, so clinical outcomes are actually very good for patients now with HER2 positive breast cancer, but if we were looking at outcomes in like the 1990s, the risk of recurrence would be much higher. 
So the majority of breast cancers are gonna be estrogen receptor positive, 65 to 80%. About a quarter are gonna be HER2 positive, And then about 15% are gonna be triple negative breast cancer, which means that they don't express estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or HER2. So I'd like to just walk through our general approach to a patient that's newly diagnosed with breast cancer. And so this would be talking about the curative setting. So when we think about breast cancer treatment, it it can be separated broadly into curative therapies. So patients that have early stage disease where our treatments are curative, we wanna get rid of the cancer and we wanna do things that are reasonable and necessary to prevent it from coming back. But then we also have a whole separate algorithm for patients that would have metastatic cancer or locally advanced unresectable cancer where we wouldn't be doing curative treatment, but we're doing more palliative treatment to keep the cancer under control, to manage symptoms of the cancer and to extend life when that's possible. So first I'm gonna start with talking about early stage breast cancer and how do we approach women um, diagnosed at these stages. And this really is the majority of breast cancer patients. So I'd say about 85% of patients are diagnosed with an early stage breast cancer as opposed to a metastatic breast cancer. So whenever a woman's diagnosed with breast cancer, we come at it with a two-prong approach. So we have our local therapies that are aimed at getting rid of the cancer in the breast and uh, sampling the lymph nodes under the arm and then um, preventing local recurrence with radiation. And so the surgery could be either a lumpectomy where they just remove part of the breast that has the cancer or a mastectomy. The decision about that depends on the size of the cancer and the size of the woman's breast and which surgery may sense that way. Radiation is generally given if people have a lumpectomy and there's breast tissue that was left behind or if there's cancer in the lymph nodes, even if they have a mastectomy. But we know the breast cancer is one of the cancers that can send off little cells and those cells could be floating somewhere in the body and they could be below our level of clinical detection, meaning we don't know that there's cancer there, people don't have any symptoms, but we know that over time there can be a risk that these cells could start growing in the bones or the liver or the lungs and that would be a metastatic cancer. So if we just focus on our local therapies, we're not gonna really address these cells that could be somewhere else in the body. And so our systemic therapies include chemotherapy that can attack rapidly dividing cells, but also anti-endocrine therapies that can lower estrogen or block estrogen receptors and then anti-HER2 therapies. And so these treatments are really important because they can you know, go through the whole body and prevent recurrence. Sometimes we'll put these systemic therapies before surgery and we call that neoadjuvant. And we use that term for many cancers. So you could use neoadjuvant chemotherapy or you could use neoadjuvant anti-endocrine therapy. And we have a number of clinical trials looking at these approaches and adding new treatments. If we look at triple negative breast cancer, you'll notice if you are um, working in clinical trials, there's a lot of trials looking at developing new drugs in, in TMBC. And I think part of that is because it's an aggressive breast cancer subtype and we don't have um, as many therapies for it as we do for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So triple negative breast cancer has an earlier risk of recurrence compared to estrogen receptor receptor positive breast cancers. So recurrences are um, more common in the first three years and most happen in the first three to five years. Whereas if you look at estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, cancers can come back in five, 10, 15, even 20 years later. Uh, when TMBC does recur, it's more common to recur in the lungs or the brain with visceral disease as opposed to the bones where estrogen receptor positive breast cancer can often return. And then if we look at outcomes, patients with TMBC have shorter survival um, and can often have really aggressive disease that progresses through therapy. 
This slide illustrates the rates of distant recurrence in TMVC compared to other breast cancer subtypes. And so if you look at this dark line, this is the triple negative patients, and this is the probability of being recurrence free. And so you can see, and then this is years on the X axis. So you can see, you see a drop in the first five years, and these are patients that are having recurrences, but then it's pretty level. And this is patients with other breast cancer subtypes where you can see that it, you know, it just, it's kind of a, a continual slope. And most of the recurrences happen, I'm sorry, half of the recurrences happen in the first five years with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And then about half of them will happen after five years. There's some unique risk factors for triple negative breast cancer. Young women are more likely to get TMBC um, if they are diagnosed with breast cancer, not to say we never see TMBC in older women because we do, but um, young women are more likely to have a triple negative breast cancer. Um, and then African American women um, have a threefold increased risk of TMBC. And then BRCA mutation carriers also are more likely to get uh, triple negative breast cancer. So for TMBC specifically, we use more chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting uh, after surgery to prevent a recurrence. And we recommend chemotherapy even to patients with very small tumors, because we know that even with a tumor that's less than two centimeters and node negative, there still could be a 20, 25 percent chance of a metastatic recurrence. And so this is what we generally recommend that if a triple negative breast cancer is bigger than one centimeter or node positive, we're going to recommend some chemotherapy. Um, and if the tumor is 0.6 centimeters to one centimeter, we're going to consider some chemotherapy. We also use a lot of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in triple negative breast cancer. And the reason for that is we know that when we give chemotherapy before surgery, it lets us see how well the chemotherapy is working. And if patients have a complete response or a pathologic complete response or PCR, then we know that they're much less likely to have a recurrence later. We also have um, a recent study that shows that if we use a chemotherapy pill called capecitabine after surgery in people that had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we can decrease their risk of recurrence. So we tend to be more aggressive, but we have strategies built in where we can even escalate therapy more depending on the response. We have a couple of questions in the chat. The first question from Marie is, why are African-American women at such higher risk? So that's a really great question. Um, there's a lot of research going on, and there's been some theories that maybe it's a genetic predisposition, and maybe it's something that could have protected them from an indigenous infection like malaria, something like that, where um, there's just a, a, something that's been selected for over time that puts them at increased genetic risk, but it's not BRCA mutation. So African-American women are not more likely to have a, a BRCA mutation with the TMBC. And so I think that there's a lot of uh, research ongoing, um, and it could be um, immune system factors too, people are looking at that. We also have another question from Maya. She said, since breast cancer seems to be hormonally linked, have there been any correlations between higher hormone birth controls and breast cancer in young adults? Yes, so there have. So there are studies um, looking at birth control pills and showing that they do increase risk of developing breast cancer. However, those studies generally were with older forms of birth control that was used in the 70s um, and 80s where they were really high doses. 
there are studies looking at modern low dose birth control pills and some studies show that there's a small increased risk. Some studies show that there's no increased risk. Some studies show that taking birth control pills decreases your risk of ovarian cancer. So I'd say that across the board, taking modern birth control pills does not increase an average woman's risk of breast cancer. But if you're already at high risk of breast cancer, it's something that you should think about. Good questions. Any more questions? Okay. All right. So, so we said that if we give chemotherapy before surgery, then we can look at the response and that can impact the prognosis in TMBC. And so this slide is taken from one study that looked at that. And so here on the y-axis, this is the proportion of patients that are disease free. And on the x-axis, this is the disease-free survival. And so what you can see is that the yellow line is patients that did not have a PCR. And then the blue line is people that did have a PCR. And there's a big separation of these curves. So the women that have a complete pathologic response have about a 10 to 15% risk of having a metastatic recurrence. However, the patients that don't have a PCR have about a 50% chance of developing a metastatic recurrence. And so this is a really big difference. And you can see that this holds up for TNBC, but it doesn't hold up for all breast cancer subtypes. So for example, with luminal A tumors, which are estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative, um, the the prognosis really doesn't depend on if they have a PCR or not. And that's probably because they're not as sensitive to chemotherapy and we're gonna be giving them hormonal therapy um, after the chemotherapy and that's gonna prevent a lot of recurrences. So when do we use neoadjuvant chemotherapy in TMBC? Well, we always use it if people have an inflammatory breast cancer or a locally advanced breast cancer where we can't offer surgery to remove the cancer uh, at the time of diagnosis, then those patients will need neoadjuvant chemotherapy to downstage the cancer. Also, if patients have node positive breast cancer, then we can offer them neoadjuvant chemotherapy and they could convert to node negative and require a less aggressive surgery in the axilla. And then patients with T2 or node positive tumors were enrolled in most clinical trials. So any tumor, any patient that has a tumor more than two centimeters or positive lymph nodes, we generally will always offer them neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So triple negative breast cancer is also a cancer where we've seen hints early on that immunotherapy might really work. And you guys are probably very familiar with immunotherapy now at this point because it's been so successful for so many cancers. But in breast cancer, it's really only triple negative breast cancer where immunotherapy can work. And we only recently received our first approval in 2019 and the second approval in 2020. So it's still pretty new for us. So this is um, showing the increase of uh, the likelihood of having a pathologic complete response based on how many uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes there are. And on the far right, this lymphocyte predominant breast cancer group has a much higher risk I'm not higher risk, a much higher likelihood of having a pathologic complete response. So we know that tumors that have more TILs are more likely to respond better to chemotherapy and have a better prognosis. Here you can see that if the TILs are really high, like in this red line, the risk of recurrence is much lower than patients that have zero TILs. So this is not really part of our standard evaluation of patients with newly diagnosed breast cancer yet, meaning we don't have our pathologist looking for TILs, but it's something that um, at some point could potentially be used. And it's something that really supports the use of immunotherapy. 
So the most common types of immunotherapy drugs that we see in the clinic are PD-1 inhibitors like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, and then PD-L1 inhibitors like atezolizumab and avelumab. And so you're probably familiar, but there's a signaling that happens between tumor cells and immune cells that goes through this PD-1, PD-L1 um, signaling mechanism. And we know in breast cancer, as well as many other cancers that the immune cells will be in the tumor microenvironment and they'll actually notice and and see these tumor cells and notice that they're abnormal but then they're given a negative signal through pd1 pdl1 that's kind of a signal it just says go away hey we're fine here and so that's why these drugs have been really successful because they stop a, a major signaling that helps cancer cells to evade the immune system the Keynote 522 trial was a, a big randomized phase three trial in the neoadjuvant setting, and it looked at um, the addition of the PD-1 inhibitor pembrolizumab to chemotherapy to see if it could increase the PCR rate. And so these were patients with newly diagnosed TNBC. They had to be either node positive or a tumor more than two centimeters. And then they were randomized two to one to um, carboplatin paclitaxel followed by adriamycin cytoxan. Um, with placebo versus with pembrolizumab. And the two to one randomization means more patients receive the pembrolizumab. And this is a study that we participated in in the breast group. And I see some of the breast coordinators on here. So you guys probably know this study. And so they got the chemo and then they had surgery. And then if they were randomized to the pembro, they, they finished that for a year. And the primary endpoint of the study was the pathologic complete response rate. And this was a positive study. So the PCR rate went from 50% with placebo to about 65% with pembrolizumab. And it didn't matter if patients were PDL1 positive or PDL1 negative, there was still an improvement with the addition of pembrolizumab. Now, patients that had PDL1 positive cancers had a higher PCR rate with or without the pembro, but still, regardless, all patients received some benefit with the addition of pembrolizumab, regardless of if they were PDL1 positive or negative. Now, yes, we care about the PCR um, rate, but the thing that we're using that as a surrogate of is event-free survival, because we really want to prevent recurrences, not just increase PCR rates, right? Because they're going to have surgery anyway. And so um, this is a co-primary endpoint of the study looking at event-free survival. And this is the last presentation that I've seen, and this is at 18 months, but we're getting, you know, further out from the study. So I'm expecting that sometime this year, we might see an update with longer follow-up because at this point, there was not a statistically significant difference between the two groups, but you could see numerically that the event-free survival was improved at 91% with a pembrolizumab. And so, you know, this is something where the FDA is currently reviewing this data and we don't have an approval yet, uh, but we may hear something in the next month. If we look at side effects, which are always important when we're treating patients for cancer, um, most of the side effects are driven by chemotherapy and not the immunotherapy. So, you know, patients had nausea and alopecia or hair loss, anemia, neutropenia, fatigue, really mostly things that are driven by uh, the chemotherapy and not the immunotherapy. Not to say that there are not um, side effects of immunotherapy. So the most common things would be thyroid dysfunction. So hypothyroid or hyperthyroid, rash, um, endocrinopathies, and then rarely you could get inflammation of the lungs or the intestines. But that's why it's really important, you know, when we're thinking about escalating treatment and adding another new agent, um, yes, adding immunotherapy could increase the PCR rate, but 
for other studies, it hasn't always correlated with an improved event-free survival. And so that's what we really care about. And so we need a little bit longer follow-up with the immunotherapy data. And then, you know, again, PDL1 does not predict the benefit from pembrolizumab. And so if there is an approval, it will likely be for PDL1 positive or negative. So, you know, because triple negative breast cancer is um, a more aggressive breast cancer, we're really talking about escalating therapy. Whereas in other types of breast cancer, like estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, we're talking about de-escalating therapy and taking chemotherapy away for some patients because hormonal therapy works so well. But in TMBC, it's more of this discussion of kind of escalating. And so um, anthracycline like adriamycin or doxorubicin with a taxane, this would be kind of our standard. If we add platinum, we get a higher PCR rate. If we add immunotherapy before surgery, immunotherapy after surgery, and then we can use capecitabine after surgery. If they don't have a, a complete response or a PCR, um, and all of these things get more patients to a cure, and that really is our goal, but the, the problem is, that about 40% of patients would get a PCR just with anthracycline and taxane. So we're kind of over treating 40% of patients with escalating these therapies. And so we really need to have better biomarkers to understand who is gonna benefit from immunotherapy, who is not gonna have a PCR, um, and you know, really weigh the risks and benefits carefully. I think the, the, the take home message though here is that breast cancer is really a treatable cancer and that the five year survival rate for all women is about 89%. If we look at node negative patients, it's about 98%, node positive 84%. It's really in people that have metastatic cancer where we see that the five year survival rate is only about 25%. Any questions about the curative therapy? Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about metastatic breast cancer. So um, if we look at metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we have two immunotherapy drugs that are approved there. And again, these were approved in 2019 and 2020. So I still consider these to be recent new advances. The Keynote 355 trial is another trial that we participated in. And so the breast coordinators probably remember this one too. And so this study looked at adding pembrolizumab to chemotherapy, and you can see that it improved progression-free survival from 5.6 months to 9.7 months, but this is only in patients that were pdl one positive, and they define this using a combined positive score of more than 10%, and this is using an immunohistochemistry test um, that's by DACO. It's a 22C3 antibody. In the bottom here, I have it really small, but if you looked at just people that were CPS score greater than 1%, there's not a significant difference and in the intention to treat population, not a significant difference. So it's really only in PDL1 positive patients, which is different than in the neoadjuvant setting. If we look at all of the completed phase three trials, we have the Keynote 355 that led to the approval of pembrolizumab. We also have Impassion 130 that led to the FDA approval of atezolizumab. And then interestingly, Impassion 131 used chemotherapy with paclitaxel instead of the nanoparticle bound formulation. And this study was completely negative. There was no benefit with adding atezolizumab. And so the situation that we're left in now is that immunotherapy is approved for patients with metastatic TMBC that are PDL1 positive, and it represents an advance, but only about 40% of patients are going to be PDL1 positive, and we have different tests for the different drugs. So with atezolizumab, we look at the immune cell percent positive. With Pembro, we look at the CPS score. So it's just in the clinic, we have to make sure that we're looking at the right PDL1 test to decide if patients should be treated with immunotherapy and with which drug. Um, another advance that we've seen in triple negative breast cancer in the last 
year or so is uh, sazituzumab govotecan. And so this is a drug that's called an antibody drug conjugate. And that means that it's an antibody that's directed against something called trope 2. So it binds to trope 2, which is expressed in all types of breast cancer. But this drug was tested first in TMBC because it's so aggressive and in need of other therapies. Um, the antibody has chemotherapy with a drug that's called SN38, which is the active metabolite of irinotecan, and that is linked. These red um, circles here are the SN38, so it's linked to the antibody, and so it gets released in the tumor microenvironment. And we participated in this trial, the ASCENT trial as well. And this was a randomized phase three trial. It looked at patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer with at least two prior lines of therapy in the metastatic setting. And patients were randomized to get the sazituzumab govotecan, which is in green here, or treatment of physician's choice. So this could be chemotherapy with capecitabine or aribulin or gemcitabine or navalbean. And this was a positive study that showed that there was a significant improvement in progression-free survival from about 1.7 months with our standard available therapies to 5.6 months with the SAZI. And so this is really, um, really impressive and very effective treatment. Um, I don't have this here, sorry, I took it out, but if we look at overall survival, there was also a really um, significant improvement in overall survival. And so this drug is FDA approved and we're using it a lot clinically, but unfortunately the approval is only for people that are in the third line uh, and some second line patients if they had an early recurrence. Um, and so now the drug is being tested in earlier lines and also in the uh, post-neoadjuvant setting. So if people don't have a PCR, then we're treating patients with um, the sazituzumab govotecan to see if we could prevent recurrence. So again, another success in TMBC. So if we look at kind of conclusions in TMBC, yes, it's still an aggressive breast cancer subtype, but over the last couple of years, we've made great advances with using more neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then being able to escalate therapy for people that don't get a PCR. We're seeing fewer recurrences. And then in the metastatic setting, we have targeted therapies with immunotherapy for patients that are pdl one positive, and then the sazituzumab govotecan for all patients. And then we also have PARP inhibitors for patients that have BRCA mutations. And the if we look at the median overall survival, it's gone from about 12 months to about 24 months in some studies. So there's still room to move and we still need to do better, but um, there's definitely a lot of improvement. Um, I want to kind of end the TMBC portion here and just talk a little bit briefly about the phases of clinical trials, but I wanted to see if there's questions before I do that. Okay. So I get a lot of questions from people about, you know, how do you know what study is right for a patient? Like we get a lot of these referrals for patients for clinical trials. So how do, how do we look at it? Well, you know, we have to look at the different phases of the studies. So we know that whenever a drug is entering that clinical development, it's already gone through preclinical studies. So we've tested it in animal models of cancer. We know that it looks like it could be effective. We know that it has favorable pharmacokinetics in uh, preclinical models. And when it moves into clinical development, it goes through the phase one, phase two, phase three studies, and then phase four would be post market surveillance, which we don't really participate in. So if we look at a phase one study, you know, what is this? So generally phase one studies um, are the first time that we're testing a new drug in humans or in patients with advanced cancer. But a phase one study could also be a brand new combination where we're putting two drugs together for the first time, um, or if we're, um, 
looking at adding a, a new drug to something like radiation. But the, so there's different ways that a phase one trial could be designed, but basically it's the first time we're evaluating um, a new treatment. And the primary purpose of a phase one study is to evaluate safety, tolerability, and to really figure out what's the maximum tolerated dose and what's and the recommended phase two dose. And those aren't always the same, but we wanna get from a phase one study you know, what's the dose that we're going to use in later studies? Um, and then we also want to look at the pharmacokinetics. We often look at pharmacodynamics to make sure that the drug hits its intended target. Um, the nice thing about phase one studies for patients is that generally there's not a limit on prior lines of therapy. So in general, for a standard traditional first in human study, if patients have had 10 prior lines of therapy, as long as they're in good shape, they can still go on to that study. And so that's um, a really nice thing, but still patients have to be in good shape. You know, they have to have a good performance status, pretty normal organ function. And there may be some other drug specific eligibility criteria, like no recent blood clots, if the drug could cause blood clots. Um, if patients have brain metastasis, often they'll need to be treated. They can't have progressive brain metastasis and go on to a phase one study. Now, modern phase one studies, though, will often have expansion cohorts and sometimes molecularly selected cohorts, and there it's a little bit more limited than your traditional first in human all comer phase one. And so sometimes in these expansion cohorts, it's limited to one particular type of cancer, and they may have some restrictions on the lines of therapy, like you can only have two lines of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. Um, or if it's a molecularly selected cohort, it may say, you know, you have to have a particular mutation that makes the drug work. So the, what conclusions do we make from a phase one study? Well, we really want to say what's the toxicity profile, what's the dose that we're going to use in phase two, are there specific supportive care measures that we need to use with this drug to make it toler tolerated? Um, it, it, they're not powered to make conclusions about the efficacy. So we can't really say at the end of a phase one study, there's an X percent chance that this drug's going to work for this type of cancer. But we can, you know, see responses sometimes in phase one that can help us shape the, the phase two plans. So once a drug has gone through a phase one study and we know what the dose is, we know what the side effects are, um, we know it has favorable uh, pharmacokinetics and it hits its target, then we can move it into a phase two trial, which is generally looking at a new drug in one particular type of cancer. And so these are, you know, disease or tumor specific, or it could be one particular um, uh, molecular uh, cohort. So patients that have one particular mutation, for example, in um, AKT or BRCA. And in phase two studies, we're looking here to really look for a therapeutic effect or what's the, you know, percent patients that receive benefit from the trial. Many phase two studies are small, between 20 and 50 patients. Still to go on to a phase two study, patients have to have a good performance status, no um, abnormal organ function, and there's very likely to be limits on prior lines of therapy. If a, if a drug um, is successful in a phase two trial, then it can go to a phase three trial. And this is really evaluating a new therapy compared to standard of care to try to make it a new standard of care. These trials are uh, almost always randomized trials. Many times there's a placebo arm, and this is viewed as something that could be practice changing. Generally, these have limits on prior lines of therapy, and many times they're in the first line setting. And so whenever I see a new patient that has metastatic breast cancer and they come to be evaluated for clinical trials, the first thing that I do is I look to see, are there any breast cancer specific phase two or phase three trials? And the reason I do that is we know more about the drugs that are in phase two, phase three trials. We know more about the potential for efficacy. And so if there is a good phase two, phase three trial that the patient is eligible for, I generally will recommend that first. 
if there's not a phase two or phase three trial, then I tend to look for these phase one expansion um, cohorts to see is there a breast cancer expansion. And that means usually we already know the dose of the drug, so um, they're not likely to be treated at a very low dose. Um, and then there's some scientific rationale to test the drug in breast cancer. If there's not an expansion, then, you know, we we would look, of course, at standard of care options, right? But I'm kind of assuming that they've had the good standard of care options. And then we would move to more phase one all comers or dose escalation cohorts where they wouldn't, there wouldn't be a limit on the prior lines of therapy. So as long as the patient is um, reasonably well and has a good performance status, still, air, still able to, you know, do some housework, make some meals, um, normal kidney and liver function, then they would be a candidate. And so in our new POEMS team, we have all these types of trials. So we have the phase one trials, which are like dose escalation, all comers. We have some expansion studies that are just one particular type of cancer. And then we have molecular studies where it's for patients that have one molecular alteration. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's important to look at kind of the whole spectrum of trials. And that's why in our POEMS team, we have investigators from all of the other research teams so that they can know, you know, well, what trials are in the breast team, you know, phase two, phase three, that could be an option, and, and then also what trials are in POEMS. So I'm going to wrap up here, um, and I'd be happy to take any other questions. Please feel free to put any questions in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. All right, guys. Well, I really appreciate your attention. I hope that you learned something. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys in person next time I do a talk. Thank you, Dr. Diamond. Okay, thanks, guys. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you.